What is the labor theory of value and why is it wrong? Over the years and development of millennia of civilization and rational logic, people have tried to observe the concept of value in relation to the individual and society. Value is defined as the degree of importance of something or action, or in economic terms, the value that a person places on an economic good based on the benefit that they derive from that good. In addition, it is often estimated based on the person's willingness to pay for the good. These definitions are important to remember later. Firstly, the labor theory of value is largely associated with Marx and Marxist economics. However, the theory was actually developed by the classical economists Adam Smith and David Ricardo. The labor theory of value states that the economic value of a good or service is determined by the total amount of socially necessary labor required to produce it. This means that the value of a product is determined and can be measured objectively by the amount of average by the amount of average number of labor hours necessary to produce it. In short, the amount of labor that goes into producing an economic good is the source of its value. The reason why the labor theory of value is wrong is because it mis misinterprets the concept of value. According to the definition of value, it implies subjectivity. As different people may benefit more or less from a specific good or service than others. This means that the value of something may be different person to person, since every individual has different preferences and desires depending on how they benefit from a specific economic good, or if they benefit at all. A value of an item can change depending on the time and location as well, as this impacts the demand and preferences of consumers. According to Another theory of value, the subjective theory of value, states that value is derived from the individuals who are buying or selling the product in question. This means that individuals will only trade or exchange if they value the goods, labor, or money they receive as being of higher value or benefit than the goods or money they give away. Wealth is not an objective quantity of scarce resources. Rather, it is a subjective valuation of the products created by these resources. For example, I am highly certain most, if not all, people value a phone more than the sand, copper, and silicon needed to manufacture it. In an objective sense, the Earth's resources may be a zero-sum, quote-unquote, game. However, the value of wealth and the products of these resources will increase as time passes and people find more efficient ways to convert relatively low valued raw materials into the economic goods and products we value more for the benefit and improvement of the individual's life and living standards. An economy, therefore, is not a zero-sum game. Voluntary trade, with some exceptions, increases the total wealth in the society for every individual. The labor theory of value, on the other hand, rejects subjective value and determines that value is objective. The value of a commodity is determined by the amount of labor time needed to produce it. This means that if a product has a certain amount of labor time needed to produce it, the value of it is as much in relation to other commodities. Marx's labor theory of value ignores consumer preferences and it only compares the value of a product based on labor alone and not on other factors such as cost, scarcity, and demands of consumers. Value, which is the subjective preference of every individual, changes every single day, depending on the market. People's subjective values are converted into objective information, which are prices. Prices change every day. Does that mean the amount of labor required to manufacture these products have changed? No. Prices have changed because people's values have changed, too due to a number of reasons such as a variation in supply and demand. Value is not wait, value is not determined by factors such as labor, costs, or utility. It, it, these factors merely influence value, along with many other factors such as quality or design. Value is determined by the individuals who are making the exchange, and value changes depending on who is making that exchange or whether it is valuable enough to justify making that exchange at all. 
The labor theory of value rejects subjective value and consumer preferences, the cornerstone of the economy. And thus the labor theory of value can be discarded and I can end this video here. However, I will provide more examples to disprove the labor theory of value. One such example is the Dutch tulip mania that lasted from 1634 to 1637. Tulips were grown in the Netherlands and their value was fairly consistent with some exceptions until 1634. Certain tulips got infected with a virus known as the mosaic virus and the effect was that it would break one petal color into two or more different colors. These tulips became increasingly more popular and as the demand for them increased, professional growers paid higher and higher prices for the bulbs with the virus and prices rose steadily. The peak price for the tulips with the virus was in the winter of 1636 to 1637 and some bulb contracts were reportedly changed, changing hands 10 times a day in a day. The price of a single bulb became so high that they sold for more than 10 times the annual income of a skilled artisan. However, in, in February of 1637, prices abruptly and rapidly fell and buyers refused to show up at a routine bulb auction. This was partially caused because of a local case of bubonic plague. In addition, people began to lose interest in these unique tulips and demand rapidly fell. The economic bubble bursted. There was a problem of disputed sales after the crash, which was mostly settled through arbitration. In the tulip mania, prices, as in all market situation, reflect people's general value of a specific product. The reason prices increased was because people valued the infected tulips more and more and they were willing to pay an increasingly higher price to gain ownership over a bulb. Prices fell because people no longer valued the infective tu tulips and they were not willing to pay a high price anymore, indicative by the fall of demand. The labor theory of value cannot explain this phenomenon. The amount of socially necessary labor time needed to grow the tulips remained the same, yet the value for them drastically changed during this period. Another example of, whose, of, of items whose, labor, whose amount of labor does not matter for its value is collectibles. A collectible is any item regarded as being of value or interest to a collector. Collectibles be, become far more valuable for a specific group of individuals, specifically collectors, than at the time they were released. Collectibles, such as Vinnie Records, that are still av available to this day in good condition, are a scarce commodity and in low supply, thus facilitating their high price. The value of collectibles depends on the interest of collectors and if the value will f will fall and the value will fall apart if there is no longer any interest among the collectors the labor theory of value also cannot explain the high price of collectibles years or even decades after their release there are also many examples such as such as a last generation product falling in price after a new generation of product is released Yet the amount of labor required to produce them remained identical, or at least didn't fall proportionally as much as the price did. In addition, looking back, any somewhat detailed analysis of day-to-day -day transactions will render this theory impotent. However, using this labor theory of value that I have already debunked earlier, Marx created a new economic doctrine, surplus value. Surplus value is the difference between the amount raised through a sale of a product and the amount it costs the owner of that product to manufacture it. This essentially means that the workers were forced to sell their labor power for less than the value of the commodities they produce with their labor. First of all, in order to create a product, you need more than just labor. There are also two critical, two cru other crucial elements required, capital and land. Labor alone is useless without the tools and land needed to create an economic good. For example, let's just say we have an entrepreneur who provides consumers with a specific product. The entrepreneur, before starting his company, had to create, design, and test this product. He had to create marketing to convince people to work for his company, and he also had to train them. He also had to purchase all the necessary land and capital goods 
such as renting a building and buying all the tools and equipment necessary for the production of his good. He worked hard, along with spending a large sum of money on his business, with no immediate reward. Not only that, but because of the opportunity cost, he lost money directly, which is an investment towards the business such as marketing, rent, and buying tools, equipment, and tools, but he also potentially lost an unknown amount of money by not working for years. Instead of working on his business, he could have worked and accumulated money, but he risked the potential money loss of not working by starting a company which may be successful or not. His workers, on the other hand, didn't lose any money by working for him. All the necessary equipment, tools, and procedures are ready for them to use. All they have to do is do a certain task for the company, and they receive their wage. The entrepreneur doesn't receive a consistent wage. It is determined based on how many co- consume, consumers purchase his product. On one day, his product could sell really well, and he gets a lot of profit. And the next day, no one buys from him, and now he incurs losses and has a deficit for that day. On the other hand, the workers receive a constant wage. If the business is doing poorly, the entrepreneur suffers, but the workers don't. This is because the workers have not invested any money that they could possibly lose into the business. They are not in ownership of it. The workers did not agree to own the business, primarily because they did not want the the risks associated with it. They would rather have a consistent wage on which they can feed themselves on. As I explained in my previous video, arguments against minimum wage, labor, just like goods or services, has a specific value attached to it. The wage is the price of labor, determined by market laws such as supply and demand. This is important to know, as we can determine that wages, just like capital on land, is an expense. Marx's surplus value assumes that the entrepreneur does not contribute anything and he merely takes value from the worker. But this cannot be any more wrong. As I stated before, the entrepreneur provided the workers with the necessary tools and equipment, which are the capital goods, land, and in most cases, the place to work, which is a building, and the exact procedure on what to do. The owner also deals with advertising his product and managing his business. Without the entrepreneur, not only would the product that he created, which which people valued and bought, would not be in the market, but the workers would also have less options for jobs. The company or business, in short, would not exist without the entrepreneur and the profit incentive. Labor is not special. It is simply another necessary expense in making a product, along with capital and land. Labor, just like goods or services, has a market price and is therefore determined by supply and demand. The real value of labor is the equilibrium wage, determined by natural market forces. No one should expect to afford the product that they are are assisting in the creation of. As many other factors go into making this product, such as purchasing and the maintenance of capital goods, such as the equipment, machinery, and tools, rent, electricity in some cases, management, and various other costs and expenses required to create this product. Another common myth that the surplus value puts out is that workers will receive higher wages if they weren't ownership of the means of production. However, this is not the case. Higher wages result from the increased worker production and competition. Profits are also usually used to pay the workers more and improve their working conditions by increasing efficiency, production, Profits are the driving force behind not only improvements in the life of the consumers with new innovative products, but also the workers. Profits are used to fund new, more efficient, and safer ways to work with not only an improvement in working conditions, but efficiency in worker production, which is used to mass produce more products, increasing supply, and reducing costs for consumers. Without profits, neither consumers nor workers will be better off. In fact, the economy would stagnate and the working conditions of workers cannot be improved. Profits are the driving force behind the increase in living standards, working conditions, and the purchasing power of the individual. Profits are proof that economy is not a zero-sum game. That an individual, by using resources efficiently, can add more value into the society than what he used to create it. But even if the owner of the business doesn't add value, 
And what if he doesn't provide the worker with any, with anything such as tools to perform his labor? Does surplus value apply then? The answer is still no, as labor and the product created using that labor cannot be directly compared. They are still two distinct economic products with different values as a result. The labor may be worth more to some person than the product creating using that labor. Or for another person, it may be the exact opposite. For example, you hire someone to make you a chair. You pay this worker $10 per hour and he makes the chair for three hours. You pay him $30 for creating the chair in total. $30 is the value of the worker's labor, as you both agreed that it is. You value the labor of someone building you a chair over the $20 you pay him, whereas the worker values $30 more than the three hours of work he put in to build this chair for you. Let's just say that the chair sells for $40, as it is the maximum price you can sell it. This means that the value of the chair is $40 in order for it to be mutually beneficial for both people involved in the exchange. Going back to the surplus value theory, you stole $10 from the worker's labor according to the surplus value theory. However, again, this is not the case. The chair and the labor needed to create the chair are perceived differently and are two distinct economic products and thus can sell for different prices on the market. Going back to the chair example, let's say that the chair only sold for $30. Was there really no exploitation involved after all? No. It was simply a case of two, two different economic products being valued roughly the same amount by a specific group of individuals. Now, let's say that, that your chair only sells for a maximum price of $20, as this is what the market deems to be the maximum acceptable price for this chair you incurred a deficit of $10. Is this exploitation done by the worker? As the worker gained $10 more than you for his labor than the product of his labor you kept and sold. The surplus value theory would say no, as it only directs itself towards the individuals that initiate the exchange as being the exploitators. The individuals that offer their money in exchange for someone's labor. Overall, the surplus value theory and the, and the labor theory of value are both theories based on false premises that fails to accurately observe the relationship between value, labor, and voluntary market exchanges. Marx used this theory to facilitate his own theory of the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, which is a ridiculous principle that I will not be discussing in this video, but I explained the basis of why it is wrong in the video dismantling the communist manifesto thank you for watching this video goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day